We're live. Great. Good morning. I'm the executive director of the Public Design Commission and welcome. If you're joining us via Zoom and would like to testify, please sign up through the Google Form link. And also the link is on the meeting agenda. I am going to hand it over to Chair Deborah Martin. Good morning. I'm De Members of the public can attend and give testimony either in person or remotely. The public meeting is now commencing with the consent agenda and items number 28717 to 28740. Are there any rec recusals to note on the consent agenda? I have to recuse from item 28735. And I have to abstain from items 28737, 28739. Okay. So let the record show that Commissioner Kenseth Armstead is recused from item 28735, and he will abstain from 28737 and 28739, correct? Okay, great. I will now call, any other recusals? No. Okay. I'll now call for the vote. Commissioners, when I call your name, please state your vote for the consent agenda. Please note that we have received a Landmarks Preservation Committee Advisory Report for item 28734. This has been shared and reviewed by commissioners. So uh, reminding everyone that uh, of the recusal and um, abstention of Kenseth Armstead. Kenseth, uh, what is your vote on the remaining items? Approve all. Isabel Castillo. Approve all. Bill Heisen. Approve all. Karen Kiel. Approve all. Harry Maloney. Uh, his, uh, and I want to know that this is Commissioner Maloney's first meeting and first public vote. Thank you. Uh, I approve. Manuel Miranda. Approve all. Meryl Tish. Approve all. I also approve all. Let the record show that uh, the consent agenda is approved. And we will now continue with the public hearing portion of the meeting. Uh, do we want to invite in before we? Yeah. Morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. This is like song too. Yeah, that's the forward button. Yeah, that's the forward And that's the um, so this is full. Yeah. All right. Great. Right. Good. Nice to see you. Okay. The first item is item number 28741. It's the preliminary review of the construction of streetscape improvements, including an L fence at Park Avenue crossover, Park Avenue westbound and eastbound between Ryerson Street and Classen Avenue in Brooklyn. For standard procedure, the applicants will give their presentation, then public testimony will be heard, and then the commission will ask questions, deliberate and vote. We will hear in-person testimony first, followed by testimony from remote participants, followed by commissioners' questions and deliberation. We can now proceed with the presentation and welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew Lavalle. I'm a landscape architect with SiteWorks, and I'm working with DVF, the engineering firm, and we're presenting this project on behalf of DDC in cooperation with DOT. Thank you. 
Uh, so the project area we're talking about is in Brooklyn. It's located between Pratt and the Navy Yard. It's along the underside of the uh, elevated BQE. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, the area is uh, mixed residential on the, the south side and uh, commercial on the, on the adjacent edges. Uh, this is the, the project area we're working. It extends from uh, Ryerson on the west all the way over to uh, Clausen on the east. It's basically a five-block distance. Uh, and this area has been looked at as part of the Myrtle Avenue uh, revitalization project. In particular, this area was of concern because of traffic fatalities and uh, problems with cars hitting buildings. Uh, some of the existing conditions showing uh, the conditions we're looking at. Uh, you can see here, this is the uh, residential on the side, and this is looking at the intersection of Grand. Uh, and, and you get a sense of the character of the uh, elevated space below uh, the, the BQE. It's now in formal parking. Uh, it's being used in kind of a haphazard way. Uh, this is looking at the intersection of Steuben, which is uh, where it goes from being on grade to becoming elevated. So this is the abutment sort of at Steuben, and there's existing plantings in the distance. Those areas for parking. Uh, yeah, the community uses it for parking, as do some of the adjacent businesses, which are car repair shops. But it's not city workers. No. Uh, it's illegal, yes. Any other questions? No. Okay. No, that's okay. Uh, so this just gives you a sense of the abutment. So this is looking at the northern side. Uh, so you can see the abutment here and this is what it looks like underneath that with with the parking yeah. <laughs> uh this this is looking uh basically one of the challenges here uh with, with a because this road is acting almost like a service road so there's a lot of high speed uh traffic and, and part of the project is to provide traffic calming uh the other part of the project is to improve sort of pedestrian crossing so crossings in these two locations were difficult because there was not clear pedestrian orientation uh, this is looking at the far eastern end. This is the abutment behind the trees here. This is an existing uh, forested area. And again, uh, some of the challenges here, the, the crosswalks don't lead to sidewalks. Uh, and we have a lot of competition with, with trucks and things uh, for the loading of the commercial buildings. Some more views showing some of the adjacencies. So this is the, uh, the project area showing the, the proposed geometries. So there is a proposal to... Uh, create through traffic at Ryerson, uh, to create through pedestrian movement at Ryerson, but also to simplify some of the traffic patterns. So currently this is uh, Park Avenue eastbound and this is Park Avenue westbound. So this is a two-way street that feeds and would be split off the northern bound would go that way and the south uh, eastbound would go this way. Uh, so this is looking at Ryerson currently, you know, it's, it's kind of a a scattered walkway through. So by providing the street opening, it improves uh, vehicular circulation, but also improves pedestrian circulation. Uh, this is looking at uh, Grand. Currently, uh, it's kind of got some haphazard movement and there's kind of an intersection here with uh, uh, traffic coming in three different ways. So it's looking to simplify that traffic pattern for the eastbound, the westbound crosses over and then intersects here. So it's trying to simplify the, the traffic flows and trying to provide a clearer pathway for uh, the pedestrians moving north-south. This is looking at the whole project area, showing where the streetscape is. This is showing the proposed urban design improvements. Again, we're trying to uh, seize an opportunity to include street trees to the extent that we can. Uh, this is complicated by the uh, stormwater uh, management requirements of the project. Uh, but again, as we're doing these street improvements, we're trying to sort of improve opportunities for tree planting to reduce heat island, to make it a little bit more humanized in space. And then the area that's being captured is right here. And that's what we're calling the, the L space. So here we're proposing widening the sidewalk, providing a perimeter fence around a space that would be used uh, by DOT operations and for sort of a future learning lab, uh, hopefully in partnership with some of the adjacent uh, users like Pratt or the, the Navy Yard. This is showing uh, the existing condition. This is showing a proposed condition, and this is showing the fence and elevation. Uh, the L fence is a prototype developed by DOT. 
Uh, it's been first used in Long Island City. It was designed by Weintraub Diaz. We are basically incorporating that same prototype uh, here. Where I'm un I'm particularly unfamiliar with this section of yes. where we are. Where are the public transportation facilities around here? Uh, there's several blocks away. It's about a, it's the closest subway is is probably a half mile walk. So I'm just curious. Have you met with the community? Yes, we've done the community presentation. And how do they feel about the loss of as hideous as those parking facilities looked? How what has been their response to the loss of those spaces? Great Given question. You do not have remarkable access to public transportation. Yes, uh, there were uh, questions raised about the loss of parking. The parking has only been available for about two years. Uh, so this is kind of an unclaimed space that's been kind of given over to parking, but it hasn't been a clear use pattern. And there's, a, in fact, a lot of abuses in the use of it. A lot of the commercial areas are actually using it for car storage. So it's kind of a mixed blessing. The community is taking advantage of the space, but it's also been not formally designated for that purpose. Curious. Any of you here from DOT? And what's been their response? So I stated the parking was not added until several years ago, but it wasn't ever used to parking years ago. And the title space is all currently parked on, so all areas around are not being kind of informally parked on by businesses for a long time. I mean, it's not our purview, but I would hate to go down this road only to have this issue not be considered as part of planning for use of space in a neighborhood that is underserved at a variety of levels, including public transportation. So understood. Just yeah. Well, Andrew, you were the one who probably that present at sorry, you were present at community meetings, I imagine. Mm -hmm. right? So can you give us a, a sense to um uh, like Commissioner Tish's concerns about the overall, people always uh, feel concerned about loss of parking, particularly when they're poorly served by mass transit. What was the overall feeling about the uh, loss of parking vis-a-vis -vis the improvement of safety here? Uh, there was kind of uh, opinions on both sides of that. Uh, this is considered an unsafe space. Yeah. Uh, there have been a number of accidents, as I've said, there have been a number of fatalities in this location. So it's trying to balance that with the community did raise loss of parking. So th there are mixed feelings within the community on that. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, this is showing the enlargement area. So the, the area that we're talking about is really between the abutment wall. That's that red brick wall I showed you with the forested area that's off to the side here, uh, putting a new fence that kind of bounds that. So the only loss of parking would be within this space. And part of that is, is also in the improvement of the traffic flow around that makes this an extremely difficult space to get in and out of. So it's trying to take advantage of a space that gets left over to some extent because of the changes and improvements in the pedestrian circulation and also that northbound shift from Park Avenue westbound to Park Avenue westbound. And how many cars typically would have parked in that space, storage cars or parked? Great question to ask. It is complete chaos under there. It would be anywhere from 25 cars to 40 cars, depending on how they parked. I mean, there, there is no, there's nothing striped. I mean, it's just a free for all. You know, there, there are people who actually work out of their cars here, uh, making candles. I mean, it's, it's just a crazy space, quite frankly. And yep, yep, understand. Yeah, no, but it's important to air all perspectives when you're making trade-offs in city in decisions. So it's an appropriate I also line of inquiry. Just a question on that because you mentioned safety. Those cars right now jump the curve to park, right? There isn't like a specific entry area. There is no entry area. They did not only jump the curb, park every which way on uh, they also park all over the sidewalk. All over the sidewalk. Right. So in a way, those cars are also creating a safety concern for all of pedestrians trying yes. to navigate these yes. already difficult space. Yes. <laughs> so so well, moving on. I could, my understanding is that also some of the community members wanted to get rid of that parking. Yes. That's what I mean. That there is mixed views on this. 
Uh, so this shows the overall urban design uh, where our, our attempts to, you know, these are existing trees. We're looking to locate more trees to the extent that we can. Again, that's something in flux because of the stormwater requirements for water quality management. Uh, but what we're showing here is that we can now get an improved direct circulation all the way along and then up and down in these two locations. It clarifies the circulation along both sides of Park Avenue and improves that connection north-south between uh, the Pratt neighborhood and the uh, Navy Yard. Again, just showing the, the character. Again, the, the L fence is part of that prototype. And to the extent possible, we're trying to introduce uh, street trees uh, to sort of lighten that experience. And just some uh, rendering showing the proposed improvement. So this is the existing curb line, which is you know then trying to be improved with street trees and then the fence area here. Looking at it from the south. Now we did show a kiosk here. I know there were some concerns about that. That's a future kiosk. It is not part of this job. It is unclear what the final uh, disposition of this space will be. We're providing uh, temporary below grade utilities for future connections if a, a kiosk were to be used. And the kiosk will be part of this DOT standard kiosk uh, program. So again, we, we drew this so that you could see what might come there. Uh, the idea in place of this, uh, we would just continue the L fencing across, which is modular and can be deconstructed as required to install that kiosk at some later date. But again, the kiosk is not part of this proposal. Just showing some of the through streets. Again, just showing the, the improvement in the sight lines, but also clarity for, for pedestrians. And then particularly along this side, there was no sidewalk and there was a you know kind of overgrown area. So we're proposing removing a couple of trees in this location and providing a new sidewalk to provide sort of east-west connections in a place that doesn't exist now. And then this is the sort of prototype fence that was built in Long Island City. We're simply uh, continuing that same fence design in our location. And we are looking at introducing uh, plantings below the trees in the area around the L fence. Again, this is something that's in flux because we're not sure if we have a maintenance partner for the understory plantings at this point. Uh, we are proposing street trees and then the understory is kind of an added a layer that we're looking to introduce a little bit more human scale, but again, we are waiting to see if that can be sorted between DOT and uh, Department of Parks because it is a net increase in maintenance. And these are the proposed plants that we're considering. So these are the proposed street trees along the remainder of the area and then adjacent to the L fence where we have very tight locations, we're proposing uh, columnar trees and then sort of a diverse uh, native understory below that, again, depending on a maintenance partner. So that's what we have. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now hear testimony. Is there any in-person testimony for this project? Or do we see any? Is there any remote testimony, Jenna? Hi, no one has signed up online. Thank you. Is anyone in the Zoom here to testify? If so, please use the raise hand feature. Okay, seeing none, I think we can proceed. Okay, commissioners, any comments, questions? I have a question. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for your very thoughtful presentation. And your map, if you go to page 15, <clears throat> uh, Park Avenue eastbound, uh, page 15, yeah, yes. At Class and Avenue, mm -hmm. I have been here at midnight. I have been here in the evening. I have been here in the middle of the day. And basically right there at Class and Avenue, that's where the traffic eases. And you can generally drive unobstructed through. And, and obviously people are driving too quickly there. But now there are speeding cameras there, which has slowed traffic down some. There's two and a half blocks right now, currently two blocks unobstructed traffic on that Park Avenue corridor, because in the daytime, especially, it's almost a parking lot. And once you get to Classen, you can drive more smoothly under the BQE. And what I'm concerned about is that your map ends where if this doesn't work properly, we're going to have a backup of traffic on Park Avenue that will then back up traffic even further into a community, because your map ends where the traffic is at its worst. 
and I'm concerned about whether or not you guys have done a proper study of it, how much traffic at what time, and will there be a backup of traffic from, because once you get to Class and Avenue, it's it's free space and you're trying to protect pedestrians and I get that. But if you slow traffic down there and then it's 50% uh, more traffic, then you get a you know a lot worse condition before in the community that's not voting on this. Correct. Understood. And that and that I you know you're, you're, you're your question. the question I'm asking yeah. here. That's a great question. A DOT has done traffic studies and they have found that this proposed flow pattern has no adverse effects. So they have looked at that. Could we see that? The, the report? Yeah. Do you? We'd like that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And so in terms of the report and its findings, did you find any condition of, of negative or inverse impact because of slower traffic after Class and Avenue? Um, yeah, we uh, did the uh, traffic report. Mm -hmm. So um, um, looking at, like it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's working. OK, um, basically, the concentration is from uh, um, Grand Avenue and uh, Ryerson, uh, Steuben, and it ends right before Clayson because that's the limits of the job. And mm -hmm. uh, they're all, those intersections were all uh, at the acceptable uh, level of service. So there is no uh, delay that's greater than 45 seconds. Okay. Is the, so based on, and we, um, we even escalated, you know, projected up to um, 30, uh, 30 years from uh, 2021. And we used the num uh, those uh, projected volumes and also still found it acceptable level of service. Okay. So by your projections and you're going to send us the report, sure. there'll be no impact class, class and avenue into what I have observed every day is one of the worst traffic patterns in the city. Again, um, when you see the report, it ends right before Pleasant Avenue. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you right now, I don't want you to be disappointed yeah. when you see the report. Okay. Because it's the end of the job and, uh, okay. you know, the but concentration is uh, of the traffic study is including Sturban, not Pleasant. We end before okay. Pleasant. But our design, though, for for final design is in, in, includes the improvements of Clayson. We're gonna replace uh, all the traffic signals on Clayson and make sure that the flow uh, for timing purposes is still you know, at an acceptable level of service. Okay, and I just ask this because there isn't public transport here and I used to live in this neighborhood for 20 years and you drive, you have to. We will send you the report. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. I have a couple of questions. Yes. Um, so in regards to the understory planting, you mentioned that um, it's still um, under the conversation about maintenance. Yes. Uh, given this is a preliminary review, would that be, um, uh, would that arrangement, I guess, be confirmed uh, before finals? So yes. That when we see the final. Yes. Okay. And if there were not to be understory planting, what would be the alternative design proposal for the tree pits? It would be the uh, pavement. So, so, so there would the, the standard... It's standard five by 10 tree pit with pavement between it. And just expose um, soil. Yeah, we'll expose mulch, yes. And would there be a tree guard? Um... No, we're not proposing tree guards anywhere in the neighborhood. The reason I raise that question is that this area is already very dirty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, people tend to throw a lot of trash. Um, so I, I would worry that if there isn't a robust understory planting, these tree pits may become um, you know, a collector of a lot of street trash. So just putting a little bit of thought onto that, we want this area to be beautified and not revert back to some of its um, old habits. We can we can consider that, but the, the challenge we have is if 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 we can't find a maintenance partner, the standard detail is five by ten. Yeah, no, I understand that. Um, that's the standard detail. It's just that sometimes tree guards help a little bit, just give it more structure, minimize people stepping on it, compacting the soil, etc. So, in the absence of understory planting or tree guards, I worried about the health of that tree. Okay, understood. 
Um, my second question is, um, we had commented before about the benches. Um, mm -hmm. We felt the placement of benches in this area perhaps is not the most ideal. It's not. It's more of a transitory space as opposed to a um, space of permanency. And I see on the comments that you are revisiting uh, the placement of benches. Is yes. that yeah, the important? community raised that as a concern as well. They didn't want it to become something that would become occupied. Uh, but uh, DOT's experiences in some of these spaces, they do need some benches. So we may be looking at preserving a few benches in this location, but losing the benches on either the north and south side. And why is that? What is the criteria for needing benches? Uh, if, if this is going to be used as a space for even some modicum of use, there may be time of arrival where people are waiting to go into the space. It's not meant for, you know, this is an open space. People are going to come hang out. It's just that if, if there is activity going on here, there may need to be some seating. Okay. I guess perhaps the activity that may be going on there is not clear to us. Can you speak a little bit more about what are the plans yeah. for that? So it, it, the idea is it, it's basically a DOT uh, operational space, but the, there is the notion that it could be used as an outdoor learning lab. So as they develop prototypes, uh, they're looking for an outdoor space where they could be uh, sort of working with prototypes, uh, whether it's bollards, benches, any kind of number of things. Uh, and also trying to use it in partnership with Pratt or uh, mm -hmm. the Navy Yard. So the, the idea of having an enclosed space so that they can have these activities without it becoming looking un unsightly. Uh, but the idea is not that this is going to be a place where we're going to have concerts and you know festivals. It's a place that's going to be kind of an operational facility. And that's why it's enclosed. Okay. Sorry. Why would that be? The, I, I mean, I, I'm just curious. It seems like the air quality and the sound quality there would be very poor. So why would you use that for a learning lab? Uh, because it, it's basically, it's available space for prototyping. Right, but I mean, it's a big city, like why that space? That's- Commissioner, uh, uh, yeah. DOT, how are you? Thank you. Um, so- Always, always, full responsibility, truly. Um, I, I think we were really excited by this space as a potential place to prototype. Uh, one, because of its proximity to Pratt and to the Navy Yard. It also has great access to the BQE. So in terms of bringing in large prototypes or materials or whatnot, yeah. it becomes a, a space to do that. I think we are also envisioning this as a space where we kind of want to be able to test it in the dirtiest of conditions oh, okay. to really see how it works. Obviously, we're working on trying to improve space underneath elevated yeah, across right. the city. And so this is a good test bed for that. Yeah. Um, and it just allows us to break things without having to worry about it so much, right? Like yeah. it gives us that flexibility. So that's why we thought this was a really good opportunity to, to do this. Okay, things. thank you. That's very so, helpful. So I was, Nick, I was like, it's hard to imagine what yeah, you'd be doing there. Yeah. yeah. So right. Nick, is that going to be a staffed space then? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, I think we are looking at, uh, you know, potential operational for some of our public space uses, right? So, for, uh -huh. so there'll be a lot of activity coming in and out. And then, of course, if we are able to successfully partner with Pratt, they have eyes on the street in terms okay. of being a couple blocks away. And so we'll be working with them very regularly. And I have to ask, is there going to be DOT specific parking for DOT staff and, and for that? Uh, we haven't facility? gotten that far, quite frankly. Like we're just really envisioning this as a space to 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 test. Uh, there will be space for trucks to come in and unload materials. So there's going to be that working space. But we do not envision this as a space for like DOT to just park our cars. And, uh, and OK, yeah. thanks. The thing that is most curious to me is the the like on page 21 where you have the the kind of storefront in the the elevated space and uh oh, you mean 22, this sorry. Yeah. yeah 22 and here i i i it would help to have um your community partners actually have a list of what they would like to do there as opposed to this, because I, I, I don't see that anybody would want to buy or sell food from there. Right. So, and I, and I'm starting to, and I'm starting to get like, well, like understand. I get that you want it to be usable for, for partners, but like how? And so I take complete responsibility for this drawing. We were given a plan that said future kiosk. And I said, what do you mean? Well, we can run a kiosk there. So I immediately rendered this, yeah. which is kind of thoughtless. Uh, the idea of the kiosk is it could be, it would have electric, water, and potentially sanitary. So that could be in, in service of the space behind it. It could be flipped backwards, and it would service the space from the interior only is probably most likely what it would be. I, I don't think 
uh, other than the fact that I drew it like it was a concession where you get bagels. Uh, it, I think the idea was it's a space that would have some usable utilities to it, but I don't think it's really ever meant to be a food concession, quite frankly. And and if it were, but if it were something that was outward facing, you know, what would the list of those things be? And and I think that that's a good question for you to take to the community as you're continuing to have, because I know you're having ongoing conversations with people in the community. What what would you actually want there? Um, and then also because this is about stitching communities together that have been, you know, like you're not necessarily stitching it together to do the public housing that's on one side, but you are stitching together storage units and uh, the shopping on the other side and residential on this side. So what is it, what is it at that intermediate point? Like what is it that people would want? And I, and I think that that question has to be asked very strongly. Otherwise I think, yes, it will be useful to DOT and yes, it will make this space a little cleaner, but it will still be a bit alien for people. They won't, people in the community won't feel like they have a stake in it. They'll just feel like it's, it's a better passageway to something else. So th that's my question to you. Like, how will you decide what people want? Um, just consider, uh, we have prototyped something similar at uh, Far Rockaway, um, where uh, the organization that is using it does program it. It's it's not a, a food concession. It's storage. I mean, they have student activities during the day. So, you know, those. Th th this is a future use that we're really contemplating that would really have to be with a partner. Like if Pratt were to use it, it would be an institutional use, maybe uh, not not a food concession. I mean, maybe 30 years down the road when, when this area completely changes, it might be very conducive to something else. But what I'm saying is that like to spitball a bit, for instance, if you guys want to prototype in the space, Pratt Sculpture could also want to have an exhibition space there. So you have rotating yeah. programs so for students and and then, you know, it doesn't matter whether there's a high level of grit. It's just that people are making a yeah. sculpture that's site specific. It's a place for sculpture students to make things. Yes, but so that's exactly the thought of a hybrid type of space. Like we're trying to reimagine these for, for uses like that. NYU uh, has yeah. storefronts that they use for the graduate yeah. students to do exhibition at sort of street level. But I, I think you've got to kind of come with a list of that, I think actually would be helpful. Does that make sense to anybody? Makes a lot hey. of sense. <laughs> Yes. Uh, if you go back to page 15, please. Um, so your your main concern here is pedestrian safety, and I'm curious why there's no uh, crosswalk across Steuben or Emerson to cross Park Avenue. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to go three blocks potentially out of your way to safely cross Park Avenue? We can, we can look at adding that. Uh, we'll have to confer with whether that makes sense with regard to DOT. I can answer that question. So uh, the, the crossings things across Park Avenue, they would have to be signalized. And under the federal warrant system, we are limited on where we can install signalized crossings. They have to meet a certain level of threshold. And the reason we're able to propose crossings at Ryerson and Grand is they're through streets, so they have enough pedestrian volume to warrant the signal. Because Emerson Place actually dead ends, it kind of turns around to Classen and Steuben is a T intersection. They don't see that level of pedestrian activity to warrant the signal at this time, but it could be added in the future if, if we do reach that level. But we're restricted by the federal warrant system. Okay, commissioners, any other comments or questions? Okay, just to summarize, uh, ideally, um, it would be helpful if in a uh, um, roadway improvement like this, the implications of the traffic studies became part of the presentation that we could sort of have that be clear and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the kind of question that Commissioner Armstead was asking. But in this case, you have offered to send the report. So we'd love to see that, but we know that that's not standard procedure. Um, we would... Uh, and as I'm sure you would be interested to know who the maintenance partner might be. So it would be great to put that, uh, let us know about that. Also uh, consider um, both the uh, um, treatment of the street trees, once you know who the maintenance partner is and the implications of that, obviously, as you described, and then the placement and number of benches. 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis the use in that now um, L space. And finally, um, uh, think about, and, and I know you have thought about this, so just in the similarly to uh, the request that you include um, traffic impacts, it would be great to include in the presentation community feedback on both uh, uh, the use that you're proposing he here, as well as uh, more granular uses like uh, what are we going to do with that kiosk or what does it become? That would help us understand that 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 we know you've done the due diligence with the community, but like what what was said. So with that, uh, uh, I will take a roll call vote. This is item number uh, two eight seven four one. Uh, when I call your name, please state your vote. Ken Seth Armstead? Approved. Isabel Casilla? Approved. Bill Heinzen? Approved. Karen Keel? Approved. Harry Maloney? Approved. Manuel Miranda? Approved. Meryl Tisch? Approved. I also vote to approve, so let the record show that all are in favor and the project is approved. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we? That was easy. Is it always like this? Moving on to the public hearing, the next item is 28742. This is the preliminary review of the reconstruction of the West 85th Street Playground at Central Park West and West 85th Street in Central Park in Manhattan. For standard procedure, applicants will give their presentation, then public testimony will be heard, and then the commission will ask questions, deliberate, and vote. We will hear in-person testimony first, followed by testimony from remote participants. Please note that we have received a Landmarks Preservation Commission advisory report for this item. This has been shared and considered by commissioners. We can now proceed with the presentation. For me to start. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Diane Jackier. I'm the Vice President for Program Management at the Central Park Conservancy. I'm here with Nick Coster, who's our Vice President for Design, Lane Adonisio, who is one of our consultants and a former Central Park Conservancy uh, Vice President for Planning, as well as Sandy Huber, who is our Senior Vice President for our Capital Projects team. So we're here to talk about the reconstruction of the West 85th Street Playground in Central Park. Sorry, I don't know if, oh, there we go. Um, as the name suggests, this playground is uh, on the west side of Central Park, just in from uh, West 85th Street and Central Park West. 
So I'm just quickly going to go through the goals for this project um, and a little bit of the history, and then I'm going to send it over to Nick to go through the meat of the of the program. But this is just showing the plan for play, which is a document the Conservancy created in 2011, which serves as our guidelines when we are reconstructing playgrounds in the park. So not going to go through everything, but quickly wanted to highlight what we're looking to do here is improve the relationship between the playground and the park enhance the quality and variety of play experience, maximize user accessibility, acknowledge the prominence of this playground within the Seneca Village site, um, and also create accessible routes from the west side and to the West 84th Street playground just to the south. So this is a current photo of the playground. This is one of the 21 uh, playgrounds that ring the playground. They were built primarily in the 1920s and 30s during the Robert Moses era. This is one of three that has not been reconstructed in several decades. So there's not much play value currently here. A lot of the play equipment that was there has been removed just because it had reached the end of its useful life. So we're looking to uh, do something really fun and exciting here. This is just giving you a bit of context for what is just around the playground. There's a lot of rock outcrops, mature trees. This is also one of the highest points of the park as well. And we've taken a lot of these uh, sort of elements as the inspiration for the design that we have to show you. So this is also within the Seneca Village site of Central Park, which was an African-American settlement that existed from 1825 to 1857 between 82nd and 89th Streets and 7th and 8th Avenues. So over the years, the Conservancy has done a lot of archeological investigation. We've done ground penetrating radar for the whole site. Um, for this project specifically, we've hired a consultant archaeologist who's going to be doing some additional investigations. When we determine exactly where the play equipment footing is going to go, we're also going to have an archaeologist on site uh, during construction as well. So we're currently in the process of determining the commemoration interpretation for Seneca Village. This is an ongoing process. This is just showing one of the uh, events that we had last summer, which was really well attended. And then just quickly going through the history, here is an 1856 VA map showing the um, site, the sort of egg shape there is the current playground that we have and showing it within the context of Seneca Village. It was a small piece uh, within the larger Seneca Village site, but you can see the buildings, the rock outcrops. This is an 1864 annual report map showing after the park was built where the playground is located. This is when the playground was uh, established in 1936. It was sort of an empty playground. There's a few benches, a few slides, but showing where it was. In 1991, this was the last time that there was a uh, restoration at this playground. This is just showing the plan. And here is just some of the timber form play equipment that I was referencing that has been removed just because it reached the end of its useful life, but showing you a photo from 1993. And so here is the current aerial of the site. I'm gonna hand it over to Nick to go through the details of what we're proposing. Like that. That was good. Great, hi everyone. Uh, Nick Coster, Vice President for Design and Central Park Conservancy. I'm gonna walk everyone through the existing conditions of the site. Um, the uh, approach to the playground uh, has two uh, fairly steep uh, slopes that are inaccessible. So as part of the larger um, restoration of the site in this area, we will be um, making accessible paths to the, the playground program. This is the view taken from Central Park West, uh, looking up at one of those paths, the same path, uh, a side profile of it showing its steepness. This is a view coming up from um, the Toll Family Playground, the second approach to the playground from the park's perimeter, um, also uh, steeper than, than code requires. Uh, this is where those two paths converge at the top um, uh, in front of the, the playground itself. This was a Robert, Robert era uh, Moses addition to the park, uh, the Screen Triangle. It's fairly uh, atypical for the park uh, landscape. This is where uh, a lot of the Seneca Village tours um, meet before they start. The uh, flip playground uh, equipment itself, uh, as Diane said, there's not uh, a lot of it left. Uh, the playground is currently structured for both the two to five age group as well as the five to 12 age group. 
some views of the playground. Um, there are mature trees that are located around and within the, the playground. Um, most of the uh, wood play structures that you've seen in the, uh, the older photo had been removed. Um, a few of that night, early 90s edition of uh, play equipments that are left. Um, there are really expansive views out into the landscape within this playground. It has a great connection to the adjacent site. Uh, there's also a, a large sand area and a water feature um, and a seven foot high fence that currently uh, surrounds that oval shaped playground. The playground um, within its context, there are a lot of opportunities for play. Uh, when reconstructed, the playground will service the five to 12 age group to complement the uh, Toll Family Playground for two to five, just located to the south. These are some photos of those uh, adjacent play experiences. Um, so as you can see, the uh, West 85th Street Playground is unique in its openness and connectedness to the surrounding landscape. This um, diagram is overlaying the existing uh, playground footprint with the proposed footprint. Um, we'll get into and talk about the design, but just some, some highlights. The overall uh, um, square footage of the, uh, the playground itself in pink is reducing. The, there is a slight increase in the, um, the path due to its reconfiguration and the incorporation of um, uh, companion seating at the, uh, the bench locations. Um, and overall, we have a slight increase in um, the area of um, dis disturbance for a playground and path with the incorporation of a picnic area, which uh, is in bonded wood carpet, which is a pervious material. We're gonna walk through three um, blowups just to talk about the changes that we're proposing for the design. Uh, along the Western path, we'll be regrading and decreasing it um, to create an ADA accessible route to the playground also incorporating some landscape improvements into this area. Uh, there are, these are some sections to look at what we're doing. So the, the path is getting um, depressed with into the landscape, the incorporation of an accessible route as well as handrails along the edge condition. Uh, this is an upper section, um, again, depressing it into the landscape to where it meets, meets grade and the approach from the Toll Family Playground, which is similar as well. The dashed lines are, are highlighting where the grade um, was or is in the current park condition. Over on the, uh, the eastern side, um, we will be relocating um, some of the benches onto the paths um, and in creating some uh, landscape improvements in front of the relocation or the... Uh, no, they're actually benches that were currently on the, the path. So um, with the incorporation of this accessible path here, in order to get the grading to work, we weren't able to replace the same number of benches. So we're, we're keeping the same number of benches, but just adjusting the locations. Are they, are they visually accessible to the playground? Visually accessible. In other words, the people sitting on those benches, can they see into the playground? Uh, yes, they are. Uh, specifically, um, this bank here will be looking towards the playground, and this bank will be looking out into the landscape. Um, there's also um, keeping uh, about the same amount that we had at the entry book. For the uh, the playground design itself, um, reworking the path area in front of it to um, to better uh, incorporate uh, entry and also pull the these mature trees back into the landscape. Um, Diane had shared the uh, overlays of the, the the plans. We know that there's a known foundation of Seneca Village um, up here to the north. Uh, so the the Response and our design is to help make the um, the overall shape of the playground better integrated into the landscape to work with the elements that are both above and below grade. And uh, moving into the the program of the playground itself, we'll be um, keeping and incorporating a central water feature that incorporates um, boulders into the design. We'll be having both strap swings and tire swings. We're developing a large uh, climbing. Um, 
play structure with a lot of play value for the, the five to 12 age group and incorporating a variety of uh, bench typologies, including the picnic area. Well, the ground, uh, we'll get into that. There's a few slides that'll show the different various ground conditions. So if you don't mind, can I hold that one? Okay, thank you. Um, for the um, the path leading up to the playground itself, this is just to the south. Um, this is the design that we've used, at, uh, the Central Park Conservancy is used elsewhere within the park, incorporating uh, both an adult and child handrail into the accessible path. Sections showing the uh, modifications, you can see that the fence is going down to be a four foot fence um, and creating uh, an accessible surface within the playground itself, as well as the incorporation of the mature trees back into the landscape. Uh, a section here that highlights the location of the uh, picnic area, showing its incorporation to the playground, as well as the um, the removal of the, the depressed areas and creation of accessible space. These are some precedent images to um, show you what the uh, the character of the play equipment is that we're we're looking. We're looking to do uh, timber like um, many of the other playground, recent playground restorations within the park, uh, using timber to evoke the, the mature trees within the playground or with surrounding the playground itself. And um, also the incorporation of boulders evocative of the, uh, the rock outcrops uh, within this, this area of the park. A few rendered views just to give you an idea of, yeah. Boulders? Will a real interest in parks. <laughs> so the boulders will be um, incorporated into the perimeter of the water feature. So we're using um, spray water features here in the center, and then we'll be incorporating boulders around the perimeter for uh, seating and definition. I want to talk about that for a second. It has been my experience uh, that kids in water play, it gets slippery. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious why you would put boulders in that area. Sure, but they're I find it to be remarkably safe. They're uh, going to be ringing. Aesthetically beautiful. Mm -hmm. I got it, but I'm not sure remarkably safe. Yeah, no, we're we're working to uh, make sure that we're using all the the playground safety standards, and they're pushing out to the uh, the perimeter of the play, of the the water feature area. We made that decision already. We're working through the, um, this This is the schematic presentation. Uh, for the lighting of the playground, um, the existing uh, beep poles of the park are remaining. We're adding two additional features at, uh, or two additional fixtures at appropriate spacing to the entry. In regard to the, the planting, um, we'll be uh, augmenting the planting both around, along the path uh, as well as um, between the intersection of the two accessible paths and the entry to the playground. The planting plan um, is in development. We're looking at using um, plants that are commonly found with um, in the park and in this landscape. Um, the, and in regard to our uh, benches, um, we're using both the, uh, the, the wooden concrete bench um, near the entrance and in the playground, uh, the settee out within the landscape. Uh, and within the playground itself, there'll be a combination of uh, custom stone, uh, wood benches and picnic tables within the picnic area. The uh, path and ramps, um, we've seen a larger image of what the paths and ramps will look like, and we'll be using asphalt paving with a sloped granite block edge at all of the conditions highlighted in red. In regard to the uh, fence, these are the um, fence typologies that are found in uh, the playgrounds that have been restored within the, the past 10 years as part of the, the plan for play. The four foot high steel picket fence uh, shown in blue and, oop, and will be surrounding um, the playground, uh, the gate highlighted in yellow, and then um, out in the landscape where we're looking to do a lighter touch and not have a concrete curb uh, around the play structure, we're proposing a four inch high wire mesh fence uh, within the picnic area. Um, and to answer the question around uh, the, the surfacing material, 
uh, within the playground itself. The green is uh, safety service, which is here we're planning to use gray. The circulation paths are shown in the, uh, the yellowish color. Those will be uh, asphalt. Uh, the um, water feature itself will be using uh, an exposed aggregate uh, concrete with a flush concrete border. And for the picnic area, we will are proposing to use a bonded wood carpet uh, material. Under the play area? Yeah. W which, which the is play it? is the, the gray safety surface. So uh, up here. So it's um, where it's the, the asphalt underlayer and then the, the soft surface for fall height protection. And so that'll be used in, um, so the larger equipment here, as well as within the, the swing areas um, and incorporated into part of the, the water feature area as well. And we'll I'll conclude with a side by side and look forward to hearing your uh, comments. Thank you so much. We will now hear in person public testimony. Uh, I have here uh, Jeremy Woodoff uh, here to testify on behalf of the Victorian Society as well as on behalf of Michael Gotkin. Uh, so if you would come up to the front. As a reminder, you have three minutes for each of those uh, testimonies. Thank you very much. My name is Jeremy Woodoff. I'm speaking for the Victorian Society, New York. Thanks, sir. More to the center so we can see you better. Oh, thank sure. you. Um, this proposal is unlike the recently reviewed dinosaur playground in Riverside Park. That was a significant part of a major and now historic enlargement and redesign of Riverside. The perimeter playgrounds in Central Park, on the other hand, were piecemeal incursions with little design distinction of their own. We agree with the proposed approach of modifying the perimeter and lowering the fence to reduce the playground's intrusiveness. However, there are aspects of the proposal that are problematic and inappropriate to the park's historic design. First, the new fenced picnic area will be as intrusive as the playground itself. It would replace a lovely perimeter pastoral lawn that has large trees. The overall increase in the play and picnic areas combined is inappropriate. It was apparently added at the behest of a particular constituency and does not reflect the best interest of the park as a whole. Picnic tables could be placed within the modified but not expanded boundaries of this playground, perhaps scattering them amongst the different play features. Second, paving the grass triangle near the playground entrance will result in an oversized area of asphalt. The grass should either remain or the paved intersection should be much reduced in size, making it more typical of historic path intersections. Finally, and most importantly, are the two duplicate ADA compliant paths, which introduce highly inappropriate physical features to the park. Compliant access is important. It's a complex and difficult task to provide it on a site that was purposely designed as a foil to rectilinear and level city streets. But ADA law does not require the destruction of character defining features of historic sites. The circulation systems in Central Park are critical historic features. This extends not just to the circulation plan, but to the physical design of the paths which were intended to recede and disappear into the landscape. That is why originally they almost never included retaining walls, raised curbs, railings, or patterned pavements. This proposal is full of such intrusive features. Only one of the two proposed routes is needed. They both lead to the same playground entrance and enter the park at nearly the same place on Central Park West. Eliminating the route north of the drive entrance would significantly reduce the amount of fencing, railings, curbs, distinctive pavements, and other intrusive features. We believe it is the responsibility of today's park designers and the city's review agencies to balance ADA requirements with respect for and preservation of the city's historic architecture, art, and landscapes. This proposal is not balanced. Thank you. Uh, and now I would, uh, I've been given leave and I appreciate it to read the testimony of Michael Gotkin, who couldn't attend today. Michael is speaking for himself. 
and says he is well familiar with this area from when he worked as a landscape designer for the Central Park Conservancy in the 1990s on the West Side Master Plan, including the 85th Street entrance. The Spectre Playground, or the West 85th Street Playground, was one of the original community-funded, innovative, adventure-style playgrounds constructed in Central Park in the mid-60s and 70s. Although this playground has a venerable design history, it is sadly currently in deplorable, unmaintained condition, practically abandoned. And he's limiting his comments to the proposed reconstruction of the surrounding landscape, including historic park paths and native park geology. I thought, he says, that I might provide some context for the PDC commissioner's discussion about resolving the historic integrity of the park's entry paths and ADA compliance. Entering Central Park was intended by the park's original designers, Olmsted and Vaux, to provide an immediate contrast with the surrounding city. The West 85th Street entrance to the park with its dramatic topography and rock outcrops is a spectacular example. The steep topography here is wonderful for park goers to experience the picturesque historic park, but also presents challenges for ADA accessibility. In an earlier renovation in this area, the Conservancy already transformed the southernmost entrance path into an ADA ramp, and now will be modifying the connecting spur path that goes to the upper playground. With this simple modification, the Conservancy has basically solved the accessibility problem. The existing southernmost accessible entrance ramp, when combined with the modified spur path, will provide ADA, ADA access to both playgrounds, without the need to modify the existing northern entrance path. I believe that it's important to maintain a diversity of paths in Central Park, including retaining historic paths where possible. Paths in the historic park are not ancillary, but ra pa rather park paths are the park, comprising both the form of the park and the means whereby people are able to experience the park's important design history. The existing northern entrance path at West 85th Street provides park goers with a picturesque landscape experience the minute they enter the park, including walking alongside the spectacular rock outcrop, a signature picturesque element of Olmsteadian park design. This historic park experience will be completely undermined by the proposed transformation into an ADA ramp, including massive regrading, the addition of railings, and also new stone elements. The proposed boulder retaining walls to be built adjacent to the rock outcrop would belittle the dramatic scale of the original outcrop. Both the native geology and the park's design history will be drastically compromised by this proposal. Because the duplication of an ADA entrance ramp is unnecessary at the West 85th Street entrance, with the existing southern entrance ramp to be joined with the modified spur path, I would ask the PDA, PDC commissioners to please join me and Landmark West and also other city preservation organizations in requesting that the Conservancy reconsider the drastic alteration of this picturesque landscape experience and instead retain the wonderful existing northern path and leave the dramatic rock we outcrop unmolested in its original context. And there are illustrations that Michael sent along with his written testimony this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony and thank you, Mr. Godkin, please. Okay. Thank you. Jenna, has anybody signed up for remote testimony? Hi, there's no additional testimony um, signups online. Is anyone within the Zoom here to testify on this project? Seeing none, I think we can proceed. Thanks. Okay, commissioners, questions, comments? Isabel, I can start. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I think the, the new layout um, is great and respectful of the existing trees, um, putting them back into the landscape to ensure their healthy development over time and creating play features are really nestled very well um, within the canopy of the existing trees. I also very much appreciate the overall thematic of the playground and the use, the combined use of more formal seating and the type of, um, you know, standard benches as well as rocks and, and and um, wood logs that create a little more of a flexible, creative type of approach for kids. So I think all of that um, is very successful. I I do have a question about the picnic area. Um, overall, you know, it 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 feels um, not as integrated with the nice organic geometry of the rest of the playground. 
It has a different materiality. It's surrounded by a different fence. It, it's, it's access from the playground to the picnic area is, is quite um, limited. Can you speak a little bit about where did the idea of the picnic area come from, given that the, the previous playground does not have it? And what was the design criteria that led to the current proposal? Or can you hear me? Yes. Come up, sure. For the um, the design of, of the picnic area, it's something that we've been incorporating into many of the um, playground restorations that have um, been done in the, the recent years. Um, through our, our user surveys, it's uh, something that is desirable. Um, and in terms of its um, its, its overall um, aesthetic, as you can see, the uh, the path or the the topography of the site here, this is sloping downward. So it's it's not really um, very visible from the the paths itself. Um, in in terms of its um, overall uh, size, um, the the feedback we had received from the uh, landmarks um, review, just step ahead here to this image, it was much um, larger uh, prior. So since our, our conversations there, we've um, looked to um, reduce it. Also the use of the different fence typologies. Um, the, the goal with using the wire mesh fence is really that um, this, uh, the the, the shape of sort of the, the, the double kidney bean will be the, the presence within the landscape, but the wire mesh fence will recede into the landscape as well as the use of the, the bonded wood carpet material, which is um, very much like a wood chip material. Um, anything else that, Lane, do you want to add in? Hi, just since I uh, worked on the plan for play and the fence typologies is something that we um, focused a lot on to, um, just wanted to be clear that we we have used these fence these two fence types on every playground that we have done in the last ten years under the plan for play and there are two um, two different conditions for the fence types the the picket fence is on a curb with uh, that contains a paved play area um, the landscape fence is a fence that we use it's not on a curb it goes through landscape it um, because it's not on a curb and because of the, uh, because of the design of it. It can step so it can go through topography. So we use that very specifically in a landscape context. And all 16 playgrounds that we've done um, since 2013, we've used these two types. We have we have um, also uh, one or the other. And uh, in two playgrounds, we've used both where we have kind of both conditions. So I uh, just wanted to, it's a very kind of well-established typology that we use in the park. Thank you for that explanation. I mean, I think my my main comment is that um, the picnic area is likely going to be used by parents or families of children in this space, right? You're not going to have a regular park goer uh, walk through the playground and use the, the picnic area. So in a way, while I appreciate the, the idea of making it um, merge better with the landscape to provide that experience, it does feel very disconnected from the playground. Um, and it's not so much by the fence, and I appreciate the explanation of the fence, but it's the, it's the fact that there's kind of a, a, a separation between the picnic area and the playground, I guess, in the form of um, the various benches and perhaps the, the steel fence um, that creates a curvature. And my question is, between the material changes, the fence changes, it's it, it being placed like an appendix to the more integrated playground and that um, barrier, it just feels very... Um, it feels disjointed from what I think is a very successful playground layout. And I'm just wondering if there's ways through the use of your geometry where perhaps the mulch area can read as one of the play safety areas, which is more of a shape within a larger, more consistent shape and have perhaps a more porous relationship with the playground. So while the spaces are still um, separated because they have separate uses, there's a little more of fluidity of movement between the picnic area and the play spaces. Cause I would imagine kids are running back and forth and maybe parents are more settled in the picnic area. And you may wanna have a little bit more um, accessibility between the two spaces. Did, 
did you want us to respond or okay sure yeah no uh thank you those are those are all good points um and I, I think we can we can take a look at that to see how we can um make it feel more integrated um you had uh you had explained uh well as as Isabel noted the different um uses for the different fence typologies mm -hmm. but uh in the, I think you said it was two playgrounds we were using for both. Um, I'm just wondering, like, if it is only the intention that uh, playground users, like families in the playground, would only they would use the picnic area, is there some reason why it couldn't just be, as Isabel was suggesting, like, uh, in, more well integrated? Like, why does it need to be distinguished so uh, distinctly in terms of materiality and fencing? Sure. Sure. Um, no, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and so I think the, the idea with the picnic area, and we have done this um, uh, most recently at the 96th Street playground, is that, um, is that we often have um, families um, have either birthday parties or there's family outings and there are picnic, picnic tables within a paved playground. And we, when we um, develop this approach of, of, um, of putting the picnic tables and the picnic area um, kind of attached, but but within landscape, there were a few goals, one of which is to reduce the imper you know, the impervious pavement. Um, and the second of which is the 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 idea, the the desire for families to kind of picnic in the park. Um, they do want to kind of picnic in the park. And so the idea has has been to kind of treat it much lighter like it's part of the landscape, but families do still want that security of having a contained space that the children um, can't um, can't run out of. So the approach was, um, and I think it has been successful um, when we have done it in other places, 96th Street specifically a picnic area, but also other places where we've had not necessarily picnic area, but a small, and it, this is relatively small in the scale of the broader landscape, a small portion of the surrounding landscape that is only accessible to the families and is contained for that security, but visually have it not be um, so formalized and paved and with a you know with a curb and a and a heavier fence around it. Um, so that's the idea is to and and we completely understand because the um, the, the question because the the park landscape is for everybody. And we're very kind of certainly ne would never increase a paved footprint of a, of a playground. No playground that the Conservancy has ever rebuilt have we increased the, pave, the paved footprint. But acknowledging something that we've heard over the years about just the desire to kind of have a little bit of, you know, of this space and to say picnic and to have it be in a more natural space, but not to have to then be outside of the place that's secure, that where, where kids can kind of run off um, is sort is the goal. I see. That's and very helpful. I Thank think you. that all makes sense. Is that just that when you go to your fence diagram, yeah. it's it's the fence, it's the blue fence separating right. the picnic area from the play area. Mm -hmm. That at least is my bigger concern. With everything you explained, I think you you want the picnic area to feel part of the playground, and there's other ways to create that sense of separation while still being integrated. Mm -hmm. This feels to me like you're being corralled off to the side. And it just doesn't feel like it's part of the experience of the playground, which I think is very fluid and very successful. So yeah. I, for me, it's rethinking that edge and yeah. making it um, still collected, but perhaps more with rocks and um, and some of the logs and things that just feel like part of the environment, mm -hmm. not a fence within a fence. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Which I think makes sense. And I think we've that was a little bit of also a response to some of the Am I correct to from from LPC wanting to kind of see that that more closed? But I think we understand kind of both. Um, and um, I would just also say in terms of the shape of the playground, because I know that oftentimes like in plan, things can look um, you're you're kind of straight. You're kind of moving between the trees. So I think when you went from the larger to the smaller, you're kind of bound by the trees. And I think I, I'm sure the team can look at it a little bit more closely and, uh, and look at it again. But um, but I also do think that when the when the um the when when the shape is the shape of something that is is so light to begin with in other words it's not paved there's no curb it's not a heavy fence it does recede more than the you know the shape of the actual playground which is paved has a curb has a fence so that's kind of that's another part of the considerations i think just just to encapsulate really quickly briefly 
So it is parents who want this space to be more demarcated over think, your I course think, of accumulated knowledge. Yeah. And I think, yes. And I think it's, it's I mean, it's parents and their kids who, um, who do. Um, but kids don't do, fill out surveys. No, no, no. Yeah. Who, but okay. who do have lunch and playgrounds and right. picnic and have birthday parties. Um, and, um, and I'm not, I, they haven't necessarily expressly said like, we want you to do a picnic area that is, but the idea of taking the tables out of the playground right. and putting it in, I, I would say it's more of a park and conservancy goal to make it not be um, permeable, to not be impervious and to not be mm. paved. Um, and to, to, to acknowledge that all, that families also do picnic outside of the playground um, as well in order to, you know, to have that experience. So um, I don't know if is, is that answering your question? Not quite. Well, I, I'm just very concerned about yeah. the who. Mm -hmm. And if the who is that you're deciding that there should be a separate use and I, I, I'm just trying to think of if if I were in this park with my five and a seven year old, mm -hmm. yeah, they're running back and forth, yeah. And if if parents are saying that it's better for them to have a calm area where they can eat, and the kids feel like they're contained because that keeps them there to eat, it's a very different thing than you, you know, sort of making a different kind of decision based on design. And so I'm trying to figure out if your design wraparound is is wrapped around this need that parents are articulating. And that I think also blends in with what Commissioner Castillo was questioning you mm -hmm. about, how it is that it feels to be in that space mm -hmm. and whether or not it feels like it is a comfortable space to move back and forth. And if parents are saying, I don't want it to be comfortable, I want my kid to sit down and eat. Mm -hmm. It's a very different thing. Yeah. Do you, you understand what I'm yeah. trying to get at? Yeah. And I, and I would understand a design element that would say, well, that isn't that comfortable because we're having a problem. They don't want to sit and eat, yeah. but we have to be here all day and we want to eat. Yeah. Do you, do you see what I'm sure. trying to get at? It's yeah. a practical issue. Yeah. And so if the practicality of it is that you need to have this disjuncture, then you make that disjuncture because kids don't always get what they want. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I think exactly. I, Not I me, for that. sure. I miss that. But, um, yeah. yeah, and I think to Commissioner Castillo's point, we can um, approach it in different ways with elements like benches, boulders to sort of keep keep that um, separation, but make it more inviting to move between. Yeah, particularly in, if you're talking about the fence specifically, we, I, we, we're we hearing you on I'm that. I'm going to handle yeah. the boulders right now. Let me, I, I need to understand. I use the park a lot. I go to the playgrounds. I was unaware where else we use boulders. <laughs> Boulders. Um, we use them in, I think, a, a few of the playgrounds, right? Billy Johnson. Um, there are some. Yeah. Um, at the New Harlem Mir Center, which is under construction, we have it in a spray feature. Um, and it, it, they are in a number of other of other playgrounds and other. I'm really yeah. unhappy with them, I have to tell you. I, I just think they are dangerous. I think it opens the Central Park Conservancy up to a lot of questioning about why boulders around where kids play. Um, and I'm curious about it. And, and I participate in the Central Park Conservancy. So I plan to let my voice be known. I am really startled by that choice. I think to your point, it's beautiful and it fits in, but certainly I think in an area where kids are playing with water and running and throwing balls, throwing hit, falling backwards. I mean, this is really, these are accidents waiting to happen. I'd like you to address it. Um, do you want, I, um, um, <laughs> if you don't think yeah. you don't feel comfortable to address it in this setting, I'll find another place to address it, but I think it should be addressed. Yeah, because I don't think the loss of money, kids, and water is a great combination. Uh, do you want to yeah, I speak to Bill, you had a comment. I'm Nancy Prince from New York City Parks. Um, there are a lot of boulders in, in Central Park that kids play on. Um, we do have a lot of boulders around, yes, in the playgrounds all around the city, 
we have boulders that are around a spray shower. We have found issues when it's right in the spray or the spray is coming right out of a boulder, but we really haven't had, you know, we have, we keep track of all our suits. A lot of them are trip and fall, but we haven't had a lot of issues with, with boulders in playgrounds, but we do keep them out to those center. And in this graphic, there's some kind of in, in the middle that maybe should be yeah, moved no, out. I'd say to speak to that, um, Nancy, we, this is, um, we've been progressing this since submitted, uh, you know, a month and a half ago and, um, to playgrounds. I don't, I don't have children. This is, okay. this is, this conversation is just going to take me to a place I don't want to be. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. And Bill, do you have a comment? A couple, um, on the, on the boulders, um, if, if Nancy, I heard what you just said about other boulders near water uh, features, but maybe have you ever done like a spray study? Is that possible to see like when the wind is blowing? Because if it goes straight up, maybe there's no problem. But if the wind is blowing and it gets on the boulders, I think it would just be interesting to know so you can help address Commissioner Tish's concerns, which I understand. On the picnic area, um, I defer to Commissioner Castilla on the entry point issue, I do want to say, I think the picnic area is great and beautiful and nicely rustic. And I like that it's different from the playground structure. So um, I think it's a, I'm pro picnic area in this site. And then I had a third, uh, a question you, in one of the earlier slides you show um, people working on an archaeological site, maybe doing a test dig. I wasn't sure, but I wasn't sure if that was, it says playground, but I wasn't sure if that's within the existing playground or if that's off to the side. And the reason I ask is my question, to the extent that this enlarges or changes the footprint, is there a risk uh, to any remnants of Seneca Village below Maybe you've already planned for that and you have the answer, or maybe this till has been disturbed so much that there's nothing left. Um, archaeological studies that have been done in preparation for this and the other. Um, so the uh, the Nick referenced a foundation that was found on the north, a portion of a foundation that was found on the north side of the playground was an archaeological, one of those archaeological investigations in preparation for the construction. Nothing has been done yet within the playground within the paved footprint or the paths, but as part of the project, and this is something that um, that uh, the conservatives will be working with uh, LPC staff, uh, which uh, which kind of regulates the archaeological work in consultation with LPC. When, uh, as the uh, as the footings are engineered, uh, there will be additional archaeological investigation of where those footings will go, and then, and I think uh, I think Diane mentioned this during construction. Whenever there is archaeological potential for archaeological resources, there will be an, an on-call archaeologist um, and a and a protocol for if anything is found during during construction. So so far, nothing. You know, the playground hasn't been disturbed, but as the construction progresses, that 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 investigation will continue. Thank you. Okay. Um, can we look at the uh, the diagram that indicates materials on the ground plane? I just had a question about that. The pink is, uh, the pink area is the spray area, right? Mm -hmm. And so it says there that's exposed aggregate concrete and flush concrete border. Is that typical for a uh, water spray area? Like I thought typically that would be a, a more of a safety surface that's permeable. Yeah, no, we, this is a, this is a example from, um, the Lou Thompson playground in the park, and it's uh, totally around the spray features there. Side of the ah, okay. Interesting. All right. Okay. Commissioners, any other questions or comments? 
The only question I have is about, um, you said uh, at the entrance, there was a sort of brighter, broader, in the original sort of green space with the sign for Seneca Village and that's where people would do tours. And it seems like there's still um, the potential for gathering at the entrance. Uh, but I wondered if that, if, if, if that space is now more limited for people gathering to do these tours. Um, yeah, see the, the inviting green space. And so you're removing the smaller, you're removing the green space to make it more ADA compliant. But I wonder how inviting it's gonna be for people who wanna do a tour and learn about the history of Seneca Village. Right. Well, um, I think we think it will actually be, be more inviting, um, that it'll, the, the scale will be taken down um, a little bit. It's still a fairly generous uh, sure. size space. Um, also, it's very hard to, to maintain the, this grass area. Mm -hmm. It gets um, pretty heavily trampled. Um, we'll also be able to remove the, uh, the, cobble, the cobble blocks that are on um, the perimeter, and it'll actually, um, we feel, become a much um, better space for um, holding these, these type of uh, events. Thank you. OK, uh, if there are no other comments, so just to summarize, overall, we agree that this is a very successful renovation. We really appreciate the sensitivity that you brought to both the archaeology that was found and may be found and the of uh, uh, the formal adjustment to the footings of the Seneca Village buildings, as well as your uh, attention to the mature trees, the root zone, protecting all of that. Uh, uh, really appreciate all of that work. And we would ask that in the next iteration, you just take a look at that uh, uh, boundary between the playground and the, uh, if there are ways to kind of improve that between the playground and the picnic area, and also to evaluate the safety of the boulders in connection with the spray play area. Yeah, please do. If, if it were possible at all, when you're doing those picnic areas to directly communicate with the parents and to find out what they want. Because I think that that will better inform what you're asking about and better inform how you answer what we're asking about. So rather than the community in general, if it's for the parents and it's for the kids, ask them and actually have, have, have a survey about exactly what they want, why they want it, and then you're designing in a way that has some, then we have a better range of understanding of how it is that we're questioning you about what you're offering. Better to me. Thank you. So vis-a-vis -vis the question of uh, what that edge looks like, that's it, one strategy. Um, and with that, I'll call a roll call vote on item 28742. Commissioners, when I call your name, please state your vote. Ken Seth Armstead? Approve. Isabel Castilla? Approve. Bill Heinsen? Approve. Karen Keo? Approve. Can we put a condition on, though, that the, the boulders near the spray be re-looked at or removed? Well, the condition uh, uh, when I summarized was to evaluate the safety of the boulders. So okay, I think sorry. removal would, are you comfortable that that would be incorporated within their evaluation? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so in that case, your vote, Karen. Uh, Carrie Maloney. Approved. Manuel Miranda. Approved. And Meryl Tish. Approved. Uh, I also vote to approve. Let the record show that all are in favor and the project is approved. Congratulations and thank you. Moment for the team to come in.
Hi, how are you? Hi, good. How are you? I'm great. Good. Excitement. The next, yes. The next public hearing item is 28743, the preliminary review of the reconstruction of a multi-purpose play area and playgrounds and the construction of a dog run as phase three of the reconstruction of Commodore Barry Park in Brooklyn. For standard procedure, applicants will give their presentation, then public testimony will be heard, and then the commission will ask questions, deliberate, and vote. We will hear in-person testimony first, followed by testimony from remote participants. We can now proceed. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Michael Lee, representing New York City Parks. And as you see, we have an esteemed group with us today. Sheena, Nancy, and Rachel, my design director. We also have on the uh, on Zoom today is the consultant, Stan Tech. With us today should be uh, Jeff, Travis, and Donna. But I want to excite and welcome to, this is uh, Commodore Berry Phase 3 Park. Um, this park has received over $50 million in the last 10 years. So it's really been exciting and what's going to happen and what you're going to see here today. And this part of this phase, which is phase three, is receiving $20.5 million. As always, parks always has goals, goals that we reach out to the community. An example of them is destination points for park amenities, play capacity for the neighborhood, passive uses, community uses. And a, a very important thing we have today is advance the environmental aspects, improve circulations and sight lines to the park. Kind of give you a context of where the park is. Um, this is uh, the entire Commodore Berry Park right here. We're focusing on phase three to kind of give you some concept. This is the Navy Yard up across and the infamous BQE is down on the south end side of the park. A, a new aspect of this park is this is the oldest park in Brooklyn. It was started by the village of Brooklyn in 1836, known as City Park and was then changed to Commodore Berry Park because Commodore Berry was considered the commander-in-chief, the first commander-in-chief of the U.S. Navy. So it was renamed Commodore Berry Park in 1951. Uh, the park is within a 500-year floodplain. The park, as you can see, has no moderate or extreme flooding conditions, which is good news. And the area around the park is multi-use, commercial, industrial, and then of course at the top is the old Navy Yard. Within five minutes of the park, you see we have two parks here. And then of course you get outside, we have very large Fort Green Park, Trinity Park, and then on the, the left-hand side, Cadman Plaza. So let's start off with the fact of the master plan. The master plan was developed in 2019. Our consultant, Stantec, has been involved with the master plan since then. And what we did, and we met with the community back in 2019 to look at what were the needs and what were the things that the community wanted. And so from that, we developed phases. As you can see, phase one, oops. Button. Phase one is right here, which has been completed. Phase two will be constructed. Let me give you a, a tidbit. Is phase two will be completely, completely finished before we start in phase three. So we have other areas that are going to be open during the park. A very um, important element of the project is connection. How do we connect everything together? And as you can see, we have this line here of phase one, which ties into this nice little round area here, which will be completed in phase two. And that pulls up into phase three. The historic alleys are right here and right here, which goes back to when Moses did the park in the 1930, actually 1939. So we're trying to make sure that when we do all the phases, we bring that in. We also do that when you see in phase three of the park. The conditions are, oh my gosh, we got to do something here. This is nothing but asphalt. Asphalt and a little bit of play there on the side. Problems, of course, of all parks that haven't been done in many years. Last time this park was done on the right-hand side was in the 80s. The park on the left-hand side basically pretty much is what was done by um, Robert Moses at that time. So a lot of conditions regarding that. Yeah, positive. We've got a lot of positive things happening today with this park. One of them is trees. Look, we have got trees that are in great shape. And those trees are remaining. And we use that, very importantly, as the design element. How can we design this new park to preserve these trees? So starting off, we have the south, and this was the alley I was speaking about. This is the, on the left-hand side is the uh, phase two. On the right-hand side, as you can see, as I mentioned, oh my gosh, we gotta do something here. Playground needs updated, play services, everything else. We're gonna do something better, and you're gonna see how much better this is going to be. As I said, wow, there's nothing. 
community doesn't want to be here. There's no activity. There's nothing the community wants. So we need to make something happen. And so we did that. But the positive, again, I'm told you there's many positives. The sidewalks and everything around the park are in great shape. As you notice, there's that 12 foot fence all the way around, gone. We're getting rid of that. We're keeping a four foot historic fence, but 12 foot, no more. We do have some area here. This is the other alley up at Flushing Avenue. We have heat paving. So we're going to, we brought that part, that phase, that, that bit of it into the park. We're going to make sure and fix all that area there, of that area, of that alley, which runs right there. We had a community meeting in 2023. And with that community meeting, one thing that was wonderful was is that the community pretty much liked everything that was from the 2019 community meeting. Very important. Sit gatherings, seeing space, bottle fills, of course. But two new items came up that we did not have in the 2019 plan. That was a multi-use court and a dog run. But everything else was, you know, let's see if we can make it work. Can we make this happen as a project? So taking those comments from the community meeting, we looked at the aspect, we felt, how can we include those? Preserve the trees, bring up new elements, remember the 2019 master plan, and do things for that sort, and turned it into, oh my gosh, look what we have now. Look at this. We now have accessible entrance at the corner where there was steps. We have a multi-use court. We have basketball. We have a dog run, pickleball, playground, water play, multi-purpose field. And a resting building that was just renovated and brand new open. And look, all of those trees that are saved and more trees. We've got seating. Let's get into design and let's see what we can do with it. Starting off is play. As you can see, some of the things that Stantec did, Stantec was very involved with that, as I said, with the master plan, the community plan, and working that through in regards to that. So in the play area, we have kind of some cool things. Here's the seating area, which we'll talk about. And this kind of provides an entrance, an entrance wow into the spray shower. Then we move into two to five play, five to swell, and a great jungle gym, swings. We are wanting to make it lots of uses and things in that regard. The dog run, advantage of the dog runs we made so that when people bring their dogs from the community, they can go right to the corner and go right into the dog run, do the thing, come right back out. And then since the new restrooms were just finished, we've got a little seating area there. This is adult fitness and teen fitness, and we'll talk about those really briefly. We're using standard materials. Exciting colors we're bringing into the site furniture. Uh, materials of our standard materials with regard to paving and patterns and colors. Here we go. I mentioned some excitement. This is it right here. Bamboo jungle. This is something new that we're doing and we're trying out. It's something that's be very popular. And she saw this and said, oh my gosh, we have to give this a try. So we're giving us a try here. It's, uh, adult fitness on the other side, everything ADA accessible, multiple types of uses, bright colors, different kinds of two to five, that great neck climber thing. So the kids want to come back over and over again and really want to be involved in this. Spray shower, different types of spray, overhead spray, side spray, and colors and things of that sort. Again, let's make something happen as we enter into that playground. As I talked about, the 12 foot fences are gone. They're gone. We have the four foot, the historic fence. We have it around the multi, 12 in the back shop, pickleball around the playground. Everything is down, the views are open. We can see around. Native plant material, of course, that we're using. Oh my gosh, here is the magic of this part. Look where we were, 7.4%. Look where we are today, 49%. That is fabulous. How to handle stormwater and everything else, all the things that are happening in the future with DEP and all of those requirements. Let's get some details, let's get some excitement of it. This is the lawn with undulating lawn. Undulating lawn has become very popular with parks. It kind of gives an area to play, kind of very passive play. We have active play in phase two, which is the baseball field, the football field, the soccer field. This is kind of like, you know, let the kid roll down the hill, things of that sort. The brand new restroom building off in the distance is the playground. 
Our new ADA accessible entrances, we have ADA accessible entrances on all four corners of the park. This is one here located on Flushing Avenue, walking in, seating, benches. We have kids seating, adult seating, located around, even seating inside the playground and things of that sort. Adult fitness, undulating the basketball court, the multi-purpose court. As I mentioned seating, we have uh, seating on the edges, you know, and all, all around that. We have the seating here at the entrance. We have uh, more seating in this corner here. So different use of different activities. So a little look over here. Here's the different table seating and child and adult located right there. And here we are. We've got something exciting today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. I will ask if we have any uh, testimony. I don't see any in-person testimony. Jenna, do we have any remote testimony? Hi, we have not received any requests for remote testimony on this project. Is anyone present within the Zoom here to testify? If so, please use the raise hand feature. Okay, I see no responses or requests to testify, so thank you. Okay, commissioners, uh, Michael, is that yes. it, right? Michael, yes. any, any questions or for Michael or, or comments? Uh, I, I know that anything negative given that presentation would be almost churlish at this point. But <laughs> <laughs> but like <laughs> so I appreciate your strategy. <laughs> I'll start with a couple of questions. First of all, thank you for the presentation. I love this design. I go by this park all the time because I have a friend that lives by Navy Yard and I always stare at it <laughs> thinking like, oh my God, it's so much asphalt. So I'm very excited that uh Parks Department is doing this. We're very excited also that the design in its shape is able to carve out spaces for everyone. Um, the journey through the park is as interesting as going to the dog run or going to the playground or going to the multi-use um, lawn. And I think that's a very positive thing for this community that there's a little bit of something for everyone. Um, it's all collected. It all um, you know, creates space that are safe, that are um, designated, but as a, as a journey, as a, as a landscape is very beautiful. And I think that's very successful. Thank you to Stan Tech and thank you to Parks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of questions on things that uh, perhaps were not super clear to me. Um, the multi-use courts, what is the material being proposed there? Can we go to stand yeah. Yes, that's right, sorry, yes. That's Cover color steel coat, and, yes. and is, is it intended to be green painted? As yes, it's intended the to be green. Okay, and then the- Sorry, there. Got it, then the multi, Purpose lawn is synthetic turf, and then what is a dog park? What is that material? It is it's what well, one of the brands that we use is called K9. Oh, it's K9 K9 grass. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, it's just not super clear on the plan. I wanted to understand it a little bit better. I would say just my own personal opinion, um, super personal because I own a dog. The undulating synthetic turf area is extremely attractive, both for families and potentially for dog owners, because it provides a lot of exercise and activity for dogs. I don't see any mounts on the dog park. It seems of a size that could potentially accommodate some. If you were interested, just as a way to avoid people going to the lawn, if you give them a similar experience and maybe dog, dog parents Excellent. will stay within yeah. the dog area. We can totally look at that. Yeah. The canine, um, they have some details for that. Um, what you need is a, is a concrete edge that to pin down the staples um, for the mound, but the mound can still be built. Um, I believe, you know, I need to double check, but there's there's ways around it. It's just more to avoid dog people using the multi-purpose lawn. That's that's the least <laughs> that you may want um, in terms of cleanliness and, and you know, um, designated uses. Um, those are my main comments. The other comment, and we made this um, to the Santec team, is the plan is very visually appealing, but there's so much detail in this part that is a little bit difficult to read. And in the future, if we can get um, some plans that are perhaps less colored, but a little bit more technical, it will help us uh, look at the details a little bit more closely. Uh, the renderings are super helpful. Um, 
but there's just a lot, a lot of geometry here. So sometimes a little bit difficult to distinguish path versus planting bed versus a tree canopy. I think that will help a lot. Mm -hmm. And lastly, love the bamboo um, climbing gin. I would love to hear your feedback on how that goes. Yeah, we're hoping that um, I've been looking at things for teenage girls. I've seen those. Different colors and different colors. It's a little bit like something when I've already done it. Well, I think it's hard. It's hard. But it's good. I think it'll be fun. I thought it was wrong. Teenagers. We haven't been counting. Oh, I see. Ken said? So I have a couple different questions. One, I have used this park, but the most time that I used this park was doing Afropunk. I hadn't seen any of you guys there, but I know you all love it. Afropunk. I know you love it, Meryl. Stop. <laughs> Meryl knows all about Afropunk. Yeah, that's her thing. Anyways, the uh, so what I was questioning here is that one of the main reasons that Afropunk was interested in using this park is A, it's right next to the public housing, um, and B, that the park itself had a lot of open space. And so it made it conducive to a festival environment that could be that could be closed off. The 12 foot fences were uh, not beauteous, but they helped with that. And so now I'm considering like, oh, is this, is this upgrade? Like that was probably the time that the park was the most full during this weekend of Afropunk. So, so now you're thinking about having people use the park more and I think that's fantastic too. And that leads me to, there were upgrades to the intersections near on the other side of Park Avenue. But I wonder if there have been upgrades to the intersections that correspond between the public housing and this park. Um, and I know that you've made it more accessible to the people who live on the streets that are parallel with here on one side of the BQE. But the, one of the biggest crimes of Robert Moses is they put the BQE there and he cut off some people by culture. Um, and what I wanna make sure is that, that people feel invited into this park now that it's been renovated. Because during Afropunk, what was un unusual is that people would walk through the public housing to get to the park. If you go back to the early map, you'll see the public heart there. And so you have to go under the BQE if you're in the public housing to use this park, which is an amenity for them, it's closer to them than most other people who live in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. but they have this big impediment to getting there. So I wondered if there was talk about how those intersections could be made more habitable for walking because right now they're not. And that's a part of this that I think is important. And then two, whether or not this park is still something that is a good site for something like Afropunk, which rejuvenated the neighborhood and gave, well, not just revenue, but, but also a light to the neighborhood because people could come from all over the world to experience Afropunk, which Merle loves. Yeah. <laughs> I think Afropunk is, is, I think I'm on, am I on? Okay. Um, I know our Burke commissioner and the parks department is, is working on uh, spaces for Afropunk and, and unfortunately it, it needs a big paved yard and uh, that's not what's gonna be here. But I think this will get so much use all year and thinking about the um, access from the public housing in our phase that's now in construction, we always fix up our intersections to make them our, our part of the intersection, to make it better, to have it drop curb, ADA entrances. So I know we're doing that on the public housing side on the bottom left. Um, we can take a look and talk to DOT. I, I don't know what, I can't remember that feeling of walking under the BQE, but it, it's, it's not. I'm great. sure it's not great. It's not. So we can look at it and see what, you know, Parks Department does trees. We can't do that. And also just... where you can get in there from Ashland Place, right? That's Ashland Place at the lower. So you get in on Ashland Place and you come down Park Avenue and there's driving there and there's a light, but I think you can go, you don't have to stop at the light. So traffic can still be moving 30 miles an hour, making that move onto Ashland Place to go over the bridge, which makes also it more dangerous for pedestrians. If I don't think that... On this section of Park Avenue, slowing down traffic a little bit wouldn't be that big a deal because 
no one even no one really even know it's like a neighborhood thing that you know to take park avenue everybody else is on the bqe mm-hmm. so if you slow down traffic a little bit it would also make it more inviting to pedestrians also all of ashland place feels unsavory for walking to that park so it's just a conversation to be had about integrating the park and the 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 means of egress to it yeah and that will make it a much I mean, the, the 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 highest density of people are right there, and they're the most cut off from their amenity, which is closest to them. Yeah, we'll take a look at that. We we have a lot of, in first phase, we have a lot of street trees, and street trees slow down traffic. They make, you know, that a little bit. It's been proven that having a street with trees on helps slow down, and it makes it feel like you're walking to a park. So I know that's in phase one, but we'll see what else we can think of or talk to DOT and what's possible. But it's getting across the BQE, it's a big deal. We know that. Getting under it, it's awful. I think. Commissioners, any other qu- comments, questions? Okay. Deborah, oh, we have someone from great. Stantec on Zoom. Should... Uh, would they like to add anything here? Yeah, I believe so. Well, by Is all means. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi, hi. This is Jeff Oshesky from Stantec. I'm the project manager. Um, so far, I, the presentation has been fantastic. The questions are amazing. I only raised my hand just because we're not allowed to unmute ourselves. So, just in case there were any uh, additional comments or questions that came up, in um, we made Park's the funds. sale. Thank you. <laughs> All right, done. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thank you. Anybody else, uh, Jenna? I believe that's it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So with that, I'll call a roll call vote on item 28743. Commissioners, when I call your name, please state your vote. Ken Seth Armsa? Approve. Isabel Casilla? Approve. Bill Heinzen? Approve. Karen Keel? Approve. Uh, Carrie Maloney? Approved. Manuel Miranda? Approved. Harold Tish? Approved. And I will also vote to approve, but I want to note, I, I omitted that we had asked that you would take a look at the surface on the dog run, as well as access from the pug housing, uh, which you have a goal that you'll take a look at those two Certainly. things. So with those conditions, I also vote to approve and uh, let the record show that we are all in favor and this project is approved. Congratulations, it's a great addition. And with that, uh, the that constitutes the last project we're reviewing today. 